At Category 5 TV, we trust our files to solid-state drives by Kingston Technology. Whether for your server, laptop, or desktop computer, you'll experience improved performance and reliability with Kingston SSDs. Get ready, it's time for the tech. Welcome to the show, everybody. It's episode two of season 14. I'm Robbie Ferguson. And I'm Jeff Weston. It's great to have you here, and uh, I hope you've had a wonderful week in spite of everything. Uh, but here we are, and looking forward to a great show ahead. Mm -hmm. Tonight, we're going to be learning how to create our very own proxy server. Okay. Um, so I don't want to talk too much about it off the top of the show, but I know that it's you know sometimes hard to find a good free proxy service. So we're going to create our own. Beautiful. And I'm going to show you how to place it anywhere, pretty much in the world, using AWS Cloud Services. So oh, it really? is uh, pretty exciting. Uh, and one of the things with that too, <clears throat> as we learn a little bit about how Amazon Web Services, EC2, and Cloud Services, and the ability to deploy Debian servers in the cloud infrastructure, as we learn how to do that and how that works, um, just know that one of the things that we're going to be doing is migrating some of our data into that infrastructure as well. So I say that because some of our live stream viewers have experienced trouble with buffering and things mm -hmm. like that. And it's because we have a little single board computer of all things that is that we're streaming to and then it rebroadcasts to anyone who's watching on Roku or other HLS players and things like that. It has Nimble Streamer running on the uh, single board computer. Really? It's amazing. Wow. However, what I did monitor through my testing is that it runs up a pretty high CPU when people are watching. Right. So that, I believe, may be what causes some buffering issues with mm. our stream. Um, so there's a lot of stuff that goes on behind the scenes here to try to get it to you, get the show to you uh, in a very accessible and easy to access format and, and so that you're not experiencing things like the spinning wheel and those kinds of things. But uh, so as we're watching tonight uh, and learning how to deploy these Debian servers in the cloud, um, know that that's something that we're going to be doing behind the scenes here as well and migrating those services over awesome. to uh, to one of those instances in order to uh, try to improve our performance here at the studio. So loads of exciting stuff going on behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. How you been? I've been good. We're going to be talking to you a little bit later tonight about yeah. uh, some of your exploits with soldering. Yes. Yeah. You want to tell us a little bit, just a quick tease as to what we're going to be discussing uh my son wanted to get into soldering for his birthday mm -hmm. uh so we went down that road starting last month uh we've been playing around a little bit and it's got me thinking how can i make my own stuff at home when i don't have a big production area to make my own pcb yeah so yeah so we're we're talking talk about, about that so if you're interested in diy electronics we're gonna be talking about that and uh, wow, we've got some exciting things that we're gearing up for mm -hmm. as well. Next week's show is already ready to go, and we're excited to be introducing 3D printing to our viewers as well. Oh, yeah. um, so that's something that uh, we're going to be learning over the course of the coming weeks here at Category 5 TV. We've got a lot going on. Yeah. Um, please make sure you subscribe to us on YouTube um, and click the bell so that you get the notification every time we post a new video, anytime we're live. And also, if you want to um, get involved in the community, I think that's a really cool way to be part of Category 5 TV. Mm -hmm. um, some people still say to me, well, what's Discord? And it's, whoa, you aren't part of our Discord <laughs> server? Because if you join our Discord, which you'll find if you go to category5.tv, click on Interact, you'll see join the Discord server. It's a free uh, browser-based or app-based service that uh, you can put on your device and uh, or access through your browser on anything. And you can basically chat with the community. But it's mm -hmm. really neat in that it's more than just a chat room. It's also got different rooms yes. allocated for different things. So things that we're talking about or, for example, we've got behind the scenes. Yep. So behind the scenes is just chock full of backstage photos that you wouldn't see otherwise. Um, and, and there's so much there yes. on our Discord server. So really, you got to go there. Know that it's a, like it's a chat platform, but it, it has a, so much more than just the chat interaction. That's right. And it's not just active during the show. No, it's it's right. on all the time. And I mean, if you have tech stuff, 
middle of the week, you're like, oh, I don't know how to <laughs> resolve this issue. You could pop in there, and the, the community is awesome about giving advice. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That's pretty spot on, too. Yeah, that's true. All right, so we do have to take a really quick break, and then we're jumping right into it. After this short breakaway, we're going to be looking at how to set up an AWS EC2 instance. That's That sounds like techno babble to me. It does. How Say about five this? times real fast. Yeah, how about this? We're going we're gonna to create our own free proxy service. That's easier to say. I'm in control. I've got access. We have the control. Stick around. We'll be right back. Whether you're hoping to give yourself a little extra privacy while you surf the internet, or you want to access services that perhaps aren't available typically in your area, or maybe it's a case of actually having had your IP address blocked by a service provider. It may not be a malicious thing. I've had my IP address blocked by YouTube before because I upload so many videos and download the closed captions for those. So that has led to me exceeding my usage in the YouTube API. So then my IP address gets blocked. So it doesn't have to be a malicious thing. I don't want to give that impression, but there are very legitimate reasons to need to get around those types of things. And the nerds go to is a proxy. The problem is proxies can be very expensive to use and the free ones, while readily available, are very often either not very reliable, they're up one day, they're down the next and you lose access to your services and everything else, or even worse, they're dangerous. You don't know what those proxies are tracking, logging, and even like intercepting as you're going through, you're sending all of your internet traffic through that service provider. So there's one person who I really trust to proxy all of my data, and that's me. I'm not the same person that you would say that you trust. The person that you trust is you. So I'm gonna show you how I might set up a free proxy service of my own, and you can replicate that and create your own as well. We're going to do this in the cloud. We are going to be using a third-party service provider, and that's Amazon. So you say, oh, well, Amazon, what about, you know, are, are we able to trust our data to them? Well, what we're using is their cloud services. It's called Amazon Web Services. So it's all of their, it's their cloud infrastructure that they have for customers to basically rent access to their servers and their their space and and the the virtual servers and everything else that whole infrastructure is available to you but the deployment itself is yours i'm going to show you how this is done we're going to jump on to aws and in particular ec2 so of course you if you're not familiar with AWS, just go to aws.amazon.com, sign in with your Amazon account, and then do a quick search for EC2. And that will take you into basically their virtualization platform. Think of EC2 as just that. So the first thing I note when I'm here in EC2 is my region. And this is important because this is where my proxy server is going to reside should I set it there. Why is that important? Well, think about this. Let's say I'm using a video streaming service that restricts Canadian access to their video streaming service. So by placing my proxy server down in North California, now all of a sudden they are basically by IP address going to think that I'm connecting from California. So I'm able to work around that. Similarly, you may want to change your region based on what it is you're trying to achieve. You can even put a server in Africa or Asia. Look at that, you can put one right in Hong Kong. Uh, You can put one in Canada, eh? Uh, In Europe, you've got all over the place. And then we've got Middle East and South America right now. So it's a pretty big list of where they have this infrastructure set up for Amazon Web Services, the EC2 service. 
Um, so pick the one that is where you want your proxy server to be. I'm going to set mine. I'm just going to leave it as North California, which is US West 1. And that is where my proxy server is going to reside. That's going to allow me to connect um, as if I was actually sitting in California. All right, so I'm going to click on Launch Instance and then Launch Instance again because it does a drop down. And this gives me a list of um, operating systems that I can deploy on my EC2 instance. So I'm using some terms here you may not be familiar with. AWS is Amazon Web Services. That's basically Amazon's full gamut of services that they offer uh, for cloud users. Um, EC2 is their virtualization platform for virtual machines. Um, when I said instance, I'm talking about a virtual machine. So that is literally a virtual machine. So I'm going to deploy one of these operating systems to an instance of EC2, which is a virtual machine. So what do I want it to be? So, uh, and I was saying, hey, comment below if I use a term that you're not familiar with. I'm going to do a quick search. I've already done it before because I, I deploy a ton of servers in the cloud. I'm going to click on Debian. Uh, just type in Debian into the search here. So then I'm going to go to AWS Marketplace results. There are also ones that I've created and ones in the community. You would think, oh, well, I want to use community ones. Well, no, you don't because those ones are going to cost you money. And you say, well, but community is free. It's open source. And yes, however, it's um, not a part of the AWS Marketplace. And so you're going to have to pay for the usage to have that virtual machine, that instance, running uh, in the cloud. So instead, we're going to use one of the official ones from the AWS Marketplace. Let's see what results we get. They're sorted pretty well. Debian comes up. The first result is Debian 10 Buster, a free tier compatible or free tier eligible uh, version of Debian that we're going to be deploying. So select that. Free tier eligible so we can ignore the pricing because we are going to use a free tier. Hit continue. And this is where we select that. So, well, if we want the free tier, we've got to go with a T2 micro. So I'm going to select that. But what does it give us? It gives us one CPU, one gigabyte of memory. Um, and then we've got storage to deal with. We don't need a lot of storage because we're just setting up a basic proxy. And that's about it. So I'm going to deploy just as that. So T2 micro is the one that's free tier eligible. Don't select one of the bigger ones because you're going to be paying for it right away. I'm going to review and launch. We're going to come back to do um, settings like our security groups and things like that. I'm just going to leave everything by default for now. And we're going to launch that. So first of all, I need to create a new key pair. So this is the SSH key that I'm going to use in order to SSH into this server. So I'm going to call this one proxy server. And then download my key pair. Make sure you save that somewhere safe. I'm going to throw that onto my server and drop that there. And now launch instance means power on your virtual machine. So I'm going to push that. And there we go. So it's basically creating, it is creating a virtual machine, uh, an EC2 instance in the cloud for us in, uh, in Northern California. So there we go. So I'm going to view instances down here. And now I can see I now have one instance running a T2 micro and it is just no name. So I'm going to click on edit and I'm going to call this my proxy server. Server. Try that. There we go. Okay. So it's already up and running. Um, so if I click on that, I can see the IP address of that server. It is, I've called it proxy server, but right now, remember, it's just Debian 10. There's nothing else installed on it. So I need to copy that IP address. And then I'm going to jump into my command prompt because I downloaded the key to my server. I'm personally going to SSH to my in-house server. All right, so now I'm there. So now the command that I'm going to use is SSH and then dash I for the key that I'm going to be using. So the incoming file that I'm going to be using for the key. And that one is called proxy server.pem is what I downloaded. Then I'm going to go admin because that's the default login for the Debian AMI or Amazon machine image. Admin at and then the IP address that I've already copied to my clipboard. And if I hit enter, it's going to ask me to accept that key. And I say yes. And I am denied. Permissions on that file ended up being, note that, 
766, so everyone has access to those files. So that's interesting. Uh, SSH itself is protecting me from somebody uh, being able to compromise my key. So chmod uh, 700 proxyserver.pem. Let's try that and now try again. So what I've done is, oh, and now I'm connected. It just worked. Uh, 700 means I, the owner of that key, am allowed to um, do anything with it. Read, write, execute. Um, zero, zero means nobody in the group, nobody um, that is not a part of the group is allowed to access that at all. So it's basically a dumb file that they can't even open. Uh, but I can. All right, so now that I'm connected, I'm going to go sudo su because that's what the command is to become root. So now I am root. So apt update, whoop, apt update is going to grab my repository. As you see, this is a, an actual Debian computer, if you will, in the cloud. It's that easy. I'm already upgrade. I, I'm already running a Debian computer in the cloud. So in that amount of time, and I'm blah, blah, blahing at the same time, um, we've got a cloud-based Debian server. Did you, did you realize it was that easy? And it's free? Okay. So we can do other things with this too. We can set up a LAMP stack. We could use it for MySQL, MariaDB. Um, anything you can come up with. It's a Debian server. So we're going to be using this as our proxy. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to install a tool called Tiny Proxy. Nice and simple to install. Uh, apt install Tiny Proxy. Really simple to configure. Say yes. Here we go. And it's done. Now that we've installed Tiny Proxy, we just need to edit the config file. So slash etc slash um, tiny, tiny Proxy. Change dir into that. And then I'm using nano tinyproxy.conf and edit that. So control W in nano allows me to search. Oh, but before I do search, note that the port by default is using 8888. We're going to need to know that information because that is what we're going to connect to for our proxy. Do a quick search for allow. Alt W allows you to search again. Wow, <laughs> the word allow is probably not the best search query. Maybe search for 127.0.0.1. Um, and just below that one, I'm going to allow, and then I need to add my IP address so that I can connect to this proxy server because right now it's closed down. Only localhost can access it. That's important to note that this is, while this is a public free proxy server, I'm the only one who's going to be allowed to access it, that's going to be allowed to proxy my content my connection through it. So it is private in that regard. I need to know my IP address. So I'm going to jump over to current IP.xyz and copy that IP address to my clipboard and then jump back there and paste it into my config. Control O, enter, Control X. Control O is to write out save the file. Now systemctl restart tiny proxy. Almost done. The final thing that we need to do is we just need to tell AWS, the EC2 security, um, that um, we're going to set up a policy that says, hey, only I am allowed to connect to that server, so nobody else can connect to it whatsoever. So that's what we're going to do right now. So I'm going to jump back here, and you see this server up on the screen? Well, if I click on security, I can then click on the security group that it has assigned automatically. So just click that. And now it has leapt me over to EC2 security groups and the correct security group. You'll notice that it's already set up one for SSH because it's by default enabled. I can set that to only allow me as well, which is important. So let's do that just to be in good security practices. So SSH, I'm going to change it from custom 0000. I'm going to close uh, X that and then change it to my IP. Then I'm going to add a new rule. You saw how I got here, right? I know I'm moving really, really fast. I've just clicked on edit inbound rules over here. Okay. So add a new rule. Custom TCP is the default. Port number, do you remember? 8888. And only allow my IP. I can call it something if I want. Proxy. And then save my rules. There we go. So now you see SSH and custom TCP, one called proxy on port 8888. So how do we test this? Okay, so our current IP address is 99.233. And so I'm going to connect to the proxy. This is not 
a tutorial on how to use a proxy. This is not a tutorial on what to use it for necessarily. This is, th this, I'm making assumptions here that you can either Google it yourself because it's going to be different based on your use case, whether you want to just proxy your browser or proxy a particular application or your entire network. Um, that's going to be up to your individual use case. This is strictly a tutorial on how to build this EC2 instance really, really quickly for free that has a proxy ready for us to use in California or wherever. And uh, that's, that's it. So in my particular case right now, so this moment is not necessarily what you want to do next. This is just how I am going to test the proxy. I happen to be on Windows 10 here. So I'm going to simply type in proxy and go into proxy settings. Again, this is probably not how you want to do it. I just want to test. So I'm going to turn on proxy. I can see that there's an old proxy settings there, so make sure you're mindful of that. Um, if there are old proxy settings, you need to change it. Go to instances on EC2, click on your instance ID and grab that IP address. And then paste that in as the address for your proxy server, port 8888, and save. So now I'm connected to the proxy instantly not connected to. Now Windows is saying I'm going to route all your traffic through the proxy. I should correct myself there. So if I go back to current IP.xyz, 99.233 is my current IP. I'm going to hit F5 to refresh, and if all went well, 3.101.108.211. Well, what is that? That's my server. So I am actually now, where am I? Let's find out maxmind.com. Let's do a search for the IP address that I'm currently on. Where am I? San Jose, California. That's where MaxMind determines me to be. So that's all there is to it, folks. We have created, configured, deployed a free proxy service that we own and operate. We're the only ones who, has that, who have that uh, SSH key. So if you want to connect in, make changes, use it as a multi-purpose server, you can do that. Um, but just keep an eye on your, your billing stuff. Just make sure that you haven't exceeded thresholds and things like that. If you're just using it as a proxy, it's very unlikely you're going to do that. It's just something that you're piping data through. So check that out. It's aws.amazon.com to get yourself started. If you have questions, post them to our community. Head on over to uh, our Discord. You'll find the link at category5.tv on the interact menu. In the meantime, if you enjoyed this, if you've used it or found it useful, give me a big thumbs up. Please subscribe and we'll see you right after the break. This is Category 5 Technology TV, and I want to talk about what I'm doing at home. What's or that? rather, what I'm planning to do. Sitting around watching Netflix. I don't have time to sit around and watch <laughs> Netflix. I wish I did, but uh, no, my family always hogs Netflix, and I, I'm like, I'll just go on the computer. <laughs> which is great, because it's forced me to start... There's Netflix on the computer now, Jeff. <laughs> You're distracting me. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, but it's great because it's forced me to start looking at some of the things we do around the house and go, how can I make this my own? And so, you know, I mentioned at the top of the show that our son has gotten into soldering and he's done very well at it. And remind us, how old is he? Just he's turned 12. 12. Just turned 12. All right. Um, but uh, yeah, he's done very well with it. And uh, he's soldered two calculators so far. Um, and one of them he's taken to school, which his teacher was completely blown wow. away by. Yeah, I'm thinking 12 years old and he's already making a calculator? Yeah, yeah, he made a calculator. We got a DIY kit from yeah. uh, Amazon and he built it and it maybe two hours of work. It was really phenomenal. Unreal. And his soldering job is really, really clean. Excellent. Like, looks pro. Um, but anyway, he's been asking how to do other stuff. And as we're soldering, he's like, well, what's this? And what's this? And how's that work? And I'm going... I want to be able to teach him these things. I want to be able to explain to him how a circuit board actually works, yep. not just soldering it, but understanding the components and the routing and all that kind of stuff. And I mean, I know you can buy um, just 
plain boards that PCBs. are just rows of, yep. of, of little connection points. But I want to be able to make our own board. Yep. And so he's asked specifically if we can find a DIY kit for a useless box. You know, that's the box oh, where okay, you push yeah. the button yep. and the little thing comes out and pops it. Yeah. Give it a try. Mm. What'd you do? <laughs> are you serious? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my. oh my gosh that is hilarious that is like the mo- <laughs> hello it's like having a kitten in there it's like my cat <laughs> hey hey now so i've been looking for one haven't found one but i found a bunch of people that are like oh you can make one using an arduino you can make one using this sure. and i was like ah, if i'm gonna do a diy box useless box I want to build it from the ground up. So Mm. I've been researching how to make my own PCBs at home. Okay. It's actually not that difficult. And I was blown away that all I need is a laser printer to set my routing, like where the paths go. So you're going to actually etch it? I'm going to actually etch it at home. Oh, man. That's way beyond me, Jeff. It's really... That's, that involves chemicals. It and, does, yeah. but, but a really simple process. So I found, I've done a bunch of research into it, and so I found a, a really simple, easy way to make my own PCB, mm-hmm. and uh, that's what we're going to be doing. So my project for the next probably couple of months, because I have to learn how this stuff works, is to design a circuit board, mm-hmm. um, which I've never done before, make the circuit board, and then my wow. son's going to solder it together, and we're going to make our own useless box that i'm hoping to also 3d print the box as well oh that's cool yeah you're just diving right in i when i do something i don't go small (laughs) (laughs) and you know my approach is a little bit different because i am very much into like i like to learn something first yeah and then increase my investment in that process and and you're like talking about jumping right to pcb creation so i would back up so you know if this is you thinking hey maybe i'd like to be able to make my own circuits and things like that my starting point is a breadboard yes and the breadboard allows you to lay out your circuit that you've designed or that you've downloaded like a circuit blueprint um, from the internet or however however you've got that Uh, lets you lay it out on a on a basically a a mock PCB Mm -hmm. that will function like a PCB, but then you can just take it all apart and put the parts away. Right. And it's cheap. Very cheap. And it just gets you started. And then the next step for me is what's called a prototyping board. So you get PCB boards that have all the holes. That's right. And they've got solder, um, like, points but there's no interconnection between them so So you actually run wires wires or you run a little bit of solder between two different joints for example and you do it that way so that's my second step yes then i would look at maybe going the route of actually etching your own um, pcbs because then you're getting into like the chemical processes the and i'm i haven't researched it but um, it's a much more intricate process. So I like it to is. start a little bit simpler. My first PCB I built on a breadboard, very, very basic, but I designed it. Right, okay. And all it is is it takes a 5-volt signal, and when it has 5 volts, the relay is closed. So it has a relay. Right, okay. When it does not have 5 volts, the relay opens. So it disconnects. Yep. So. The reason that I created that, it's a purpose-built application. So I built it on a breadboard, and feeding it 5 volts is coming from, any guesses? Any guesses? SPC? No. It's another three-letter acronym, USB. Ah, USB, okay. USB pulling a 5-volt signal off of a MicroTik router. Okay. And so then in the MicroTik, I programmed code that that basically, to dumb it down, if the internet goes down, kill the power on the USB. Oh, interesting. So then that opens up the relay, and what is the relay control but the power to my modem? So mm. my modem, if the internet goes down, will automatically turn the power of itself off because of my relay right? and wait five seconds and then power back on. So it's essentially a virtual version of, did you turn it off and on again? <laughs> <laughs> because what do you do when your inter- internet goes down? You pull the plug from the modem, yes. you wait five seconds, and you plug it back in. And, you know, eight times out of ten, it's going to come back up and be working. Right. 
So that was the circuit I built. So I built that on a prototyping board once I had it working, and I just soldered it together, and it's a yep. very, very simple circuit. Very cool. And it worked great. I like that. Mm -hmm. Very cool. So tools, what have you got so far? Where are you at? Uh, well, like I said, I've just been doing the research this past week. Okay. So I'm, um, I'm at the buying stage. Uh, so we've got all the soldering stuff. I'm going to be buying the board, buying the chemicals. Uh, I've already downloaded the um, software for designing the PCB. Wow. Um, and uh, I've got a component kit that's on the way with all the resistors and capacitors Great, and yeah. all that kind of stuff. That's a neat so, thing, too, is that these these days, I mean, you can't really walk into a Radio Shack like we used to be able to. There, I know. There are still stores, like here in Barrie, we have one called Say Al, yep. uh, which is a brilliant store that's kind of like that old Radio Shack where you go in and it's like, I just need one capacitor. Yeah. And it's and like, here it. you go. Yeah. You know, it's like drawers and drawers of capacitors and resistors and everything else, diodes and whatever. But just to get a kit for 20 bucks that has oh, it's all the kind of like the common stuff. And it's a kit that comes with a breadboard. It comes with a breadboard. Yeah. And so, that was one of the things is, is I want to like, yes, I'm going to be designing it, but part of the planning process is just like you said, using the breadboard to figure out how yeah. the circuitry is going to go. Totally. And that's going to be a great learning experience for Luke. Cause I'll be yeah. like, Hey, this is, how does this work? And let's try this and let's do yeah. that. And, and then, you know, we'll be able to trial and error without, actually make our own piece. That's really neat. You mentioned also Arduino. And yes. Ar Arduino is kind of like, it's a controller. So, yeah. you know, whereas a Raspberry Pi or other single board computer is a true real computer with an operating system and everything. An Arduino is like, you just program it to do a very specific task. It's yep. solid state and it will respond to, uh, and I think this is why it would work really well in Arduino for, uh, for a, um, a useless box. Mm -hmm. Is because it's like it's either on or off. That's right. And if it's on, do this, and then it will turn off. And That's right. So very very basic programming. Digital, write four, comma high, high, semicolon, and then we're going to delay for one second, which is one thousand milliseconds, huh. uh, and then we're going to copy that line. Uh, now, what do you think high means versus low, which is what I'm going to put here? Just a guess. Um, on or off. Yes. So that's what my circuit now looks like. And I'm going to simply plug this into uh, USB power. So I'm not plugging it into the computer. I want to actually power this device and see if it runs my program. And if it does, we should see this light <gasps> flash. There we go. That is neat. Every one second. So we actually created the circuit fairly quickly uh, and created the program to now tell this light what to do and we told it just very simply turn on and off again but if you're making your own circuit you've got to like do ic's you've got to program it yourself yep you've got to figure out how wow i i want to see this project as a work in progress okay and then see how uh, how it comes together yeah sounds good we mentioned the community here on our show and uh, our discord server in particular yes. I've tapped into our community, Jeff, to go in and, and share my ideas for circuits and, yep, and things okay. like that. And there are some folks in our community who are just like way up here as far as cool. their capabilities and understanding of those types of things. So it's been really helpful for me as I learn. So oh, I, even I fully you. plan to use the yeah, community to utilize our work community. me through bugs. <laughs> yeah, and if you're one of those folks in the community right now, just, hey, raise your hand and say, yeah, I understand how all that works. I'd love to help. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that's something that I think that uh, I think that'll make a really neat feature for the show as well as you learn. Yeah, for sure. Keep us posted on that, Jeff. Definitely. I, I'd really yeah. be interested to know how things go. Yeah, I'll be posting things behind the scenes. A useless box. Any other, do you have any ideas yet? I, I get excited when I invent, like when I think of something. Have you had any of those moments where I'm like, I really wish I had something that would do this, but it doesn't exist. This is where 3D printing is interesting to me because I'm creating things that don't exist yet. I, I haven't really thought that far as to what exists and doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. um, no, I haven't really thought that far. Come up with some ideas. Yeah. And well, share I'm, those There's, with there's us. a ton of things for sure. Yeah. Like I've always wanted to do um, a, um, a house-wide sound system that mm -hmm. links up to, um, you know, our 
our Amazon device and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. But I would like to have sensors where when I walk from one room to another, the motion sensor kicks in and it will shut off the one room speakers and add it to where I've just gone. Hmm. That's way more advanced, but that's probably the only thing I can think of where I'm like, I want to do this. But see, you talk about that and then I think, okay, well, you could use a passive infrared sensor, yep. which is used in motion sensors. You could use a laser sensor, mm-hmm. but PIR is very, very cheap. Yes. Yep. And it's just a little sensor that it's like, okay, there was motion, do something. Yep. So you could create something, again, with a relay that controls just whether the speaker has a completed circuit or not. Yeah. So if it was just a, a bunch of speakers connected through an amplifier, you could have relays set up with PIR sensors that you'd be able to control hmm. by motion. Yeah, good. And if there's no motion for 10 minutes, turn off the then speaker off. automatically yeah. or something like yeah. that. Yeah, exactly. So like these kinds of ideas, like there's so much stuff that you can do when Very you start cool. to understand. And then there's the whole flip side of it where something breaks and you can fix it. Yes. That's a good feeling. And that's done, where, we've done that already. Yeah. My, uh, so, you know, you can get those little battery testers. Um, like to check the charge of a battery? Yeah. yeah. So we had one of those. Mm-hmm. And it's funny, when my son was building his calculator, we weren't sure if the batteries were working and yes. we weren't getting anything. I'm like, this is odd that, that we're not getting any, Usually, even if it's dead, it pops into the red. But there was nothing. So we opened it up. Turns out the actual connection had broken apart. Okay. How? I have no clue. Yeah. And my son's like, oh, I can fix that. Beautiful. And he fixed it and we put yeah. it back together and then we, and it works and it's like, oh yeah, that's a dead battery. <laughs> yeah, I can relate to that too. I, I use a pillow speaker for podcasts. Okay, yep. And uh, because it's, you know, connected by a wire to my phone, it gets pulled. Yep. And it got pulled right out. So uh, it's such a simple thing. But oh, I totally. What did I do? Didn't buy another one? No. No, you just No. I took it apart and I re-soldered it and reinforced it so it wouldn't happen again. Oh, beautiful. Made it better than it was. He's, he's turned his mind towards things like uh, e-waste. Yes. And he's like, if somebody's going to get rid of their TV or yeah. computer monitor, chances are it's still working, Dad. It's just something inside broke. Mm-hmm. He's like, I can fix it. I'm like, yeah. you think about that. And so his wheels are turning. And last mm-hmm. night he's like, could I do these things and then sell them? 12 years old. That's a career in and of right? itself. Trades yeah. are really a, a valuable, uh, like it's really valuable to have those capabilities. So I'm going to train him up for the next, uh, well, he's 12. So in eight, six years, I'm retiring. You're going to pay for the rest <laughs> of my life. <laughs> I had a monitor come in. I don't know, maybe a 23 inch or 24 oh, inch size. widescreen, beautiful monitor came in as e-waste. And, um, so I'm like, hmm, I'll take a look. And so my daughter and I looked at it. And there was a single capacitor that was burnt out. So I went online and I bought one of those capacitors. They sell them in packs of three and it was $12. Oh, so come on. for $12, we got a pack of three. We replaced one of those capacitors and that monitor is now sitting on my daughter's desk. Oh my gosh, that's amazing. It's wonderful. And he's absolutely right. But not only can you <sighs> fix stuff, Jeff, let's say something comes into e-waste or you, you, know, you find something at the side of the road that someone's just discarded because they, they don't know how to fix it. Um, and maybe if fixing it is more expensive than buying a new one in a lot of cases too. Mm-hmm. Um, you can, even if you can't fix it, you can do what's called desoldering. That's right. So you can remove all the good components from that and... Put them in a drawer organizer. Yes. So that you can then have your own Radio Shack at home where you've got the drawers of all these different parts. Yep. And then when something breaks, you don't have to spend $12 online to buy them. I wish I had known he was going to get into this because mm-hmm. in the summer, I had about four computers, a couple projectors. We took them all to e-waste. Oh. So it's like, oh, I could have dismantled that. Oh, sure. Yeah, I got so, them. Oh, Take well. the parts out. We live and learn. Yeah, Exactly. So, Very cool. Well, yeah. keep us posted on that, Jeff. Yeah, definitely. And hey, comment below. Tell us about some of the exploits that you've had uh, with regards to, to these kinds of um, topics. And, and if, there, if it's something that interests you that you've never gotten into, hey, comment below as well. We'd love to hear from you. And we'd love to have you as a part of that process as Jeff mm-hmm. is learning, um, as I'm also learning and getting more and more into those types of like component repairs and, and uh, circuit boards and everything else. It's a lot of fun. Yeah. It's a great it hobby and a wonderful career if you really want to do it as well. Mm-hmm. So That's true. Good for your son. I'd like yeah. to hear how he 
enjoys it. So when he's, um, I guess, 13 plus, so next year, you can bring him into the studio and uh, he can show us how he's, how he's making out. Sounds good. Very cool. Make it happen. We've got to head over to the newsroom. Becca's there with our top news stories for the week. Here she is. Here's what's coming up in the Category 5.TV newsroom. Hackers are using a severe Windows bug to compromise unpatched servers. Three JavaScript packages have been removed from the NPM portal for containing malicious code. Nokia has been tasked with building a new 4G cellular network on the moon. A new 80-watt wireless charging tech from Xiaomi is blowing our minds. And the Raspberry Pi Compute Module 4 has been released. We'll let you know the specs and how this changes things for industrial IoT. Stick around, the full details and this week's Crypto Corner are coming up. This is the Category 5.TV Newsroom, covering the week's top tech stories with a slight Linux bias. From the newsroom, I'm Becca Ferguson. Hackers are using a severe Windows bug to compromise unpatched servers. One of the most critical Windows vulnerabilities disclosed this year is under active attack by hackers who are trying to backdoor servers that store credentials for every user and administrative account on a network. Researchers gave the vulnerability the name Zero Logon because attacks work by sending a string of zeros in a series of messages that use the Net Logon protocol, which Windows servers rely on for a variety of tasks, including allowing end users to log in to a network. Zero Logon, as the vulnerability has been dubbed, gained widespread attention last month when the firm that discovered it said it could give attackers instant access to Active Directories, which admins use to create, delete, and manage network accounts. Active Directories and the domain controllers they run on are among the most coveted prizes in hacking because, once hijacked, they allow attackers to execute code in Unition on all connected machines. Microsoft patched the security flaw in August. On Friday, Kevin Beaumont, working in his capacity as an independent researcher, said in a blog post that he had detected attacks on the honeypot he uses to keep abreast of attack hack attacks that hackers are using in the wild. When his Lure server was unpatched, the attackers were able to use a PowerShell script to successfully change an admin password and backdoor the server. Beaumont said that the attack appeared to be entirely scripted, with all commands being completed within seconds. With that, the attackers installed a backdoor allowing remote administrative access to devices inside his mock network. The attackers also enabled remote desktop. As a result, they would continue to have remote access even if the admin later patches the server. People with no authentic authentication can use the exploit to gain domain administrative credentials as long as the attackers have the ability to establish TCP connections with a vulnerable domain controller. In some cases, attackers may use a separate vulnerability to gain a foothold inside a network and then exploit zero logon to take over the domain controller. I think a good example of a way for these types of scripts to get into networks are out-of-date computers on the network Yep. And also um, social engineering scams. We hear a lot oh, about, gosh, yes. like, uh, you probably received these emails that try to trick you into following through with a process of entering a credential or something like that. Uh, the, the risk that we run and, and the sad case that I see as uh, in IT is that sometimes people think, well, I don't need to update that computer because it's in the back room and nobody really uses it. Yep. Or, oh, well, we need this one to still have Windows XP because we have problems with one of our printers if we don't. Uh, we're still seeing a lot of Windows 7 systems, and that is a tragedy. Mm -hmm. If you have a Windows 7 or Windows XP system on your network, just turn it off, get yeah. rid of it. Yep. See, the, the thing is, is with those systems, so Microsoft has what we call EOL or end of life, uh, has, has ended the life of these operating systems. So they've said, you've got to upgrade to Windows 10. Well, I don't want to upgrade to Windows 10. I like my Windows 7. I understand that and I respect that. However, here's the problem. Hackers now are able to exploit these operating systems. Yep. And as they do that, as they find exploits, 
there's a couple of things that happen. One, they either give away or sell those exploits. Or two, they're just, they're released to the public through, whether it's through the dark web or even on GitHub yep. as, as security research. And so now these hackers, if you will, we're going to call them that, but realistically, in a lot of cases, they're what we call script kiddies. Mm -hmm. And these are um, not even like hackers, yes, but they don't have to have a lot of knowledge because the, the exploit is publicly That's right. known and understood. So if there are exploits that are available for an operating system, what do we expect to happen? We expect the operating system vendor, Microsoft in this case, to patch that exploit, to fix yeah. it. And that's the case with Windows 10. Sadly, though, those that are EOL. it's not the case with an EOL operating system. Sometimes we hear, oh, well, I don't need support. Well, Microsoft has ended support. That's what we've heard. Yeah. They've ended support for Windows 7. They've ended support for Windows XP. Oh, but I, I've never had to call support. I can handle it. That's not what they're talking about at all. Right. What they're saying is, is they will not fix the patches, it does, uh, the, the exploits. It doesn't matter how severe they are. It doesn't matter how easy they are to exploit. Yeah. So you have a Windows 7 machine on your network. Well, you are giving entry to one of these hackers who don't even have to be very good at hacking because the exploits are publicly known. Yep. Sometimes they're part of tools. Sometimes they can just yes. download a free tool and they can say, I want to, with one check, exploit Windows 7. And so they get into a Windows 7 box or they've tricked one of your employees, even if they're just somebody in the back working in the warehouse. Mm -hmm. They've tricked somebody into opening a file that now gives them access to the Windows 7 machine, the Windows XP machine, or the machine in the back room. Doesn't yeah. matter. And here we're learning that Microsoft servers now have an exploit that as long as a malicious party can gain access to any computer on the network, they can now get domain administrator access to the entire network. That's now, scary. Now, your Windows 10 machines are no longer safe. That's right. Because you've given them entry to your network as if they're a domain administrator. Whew. See, that's just bad news right there. <laughs> well, it's bad news. Why is ransomware a thing? Yeah. Because what do they do? They now, okay, I've gained access to this network. I'm going to sell on the dark web access to this network. Yep. You see this with, um, with townships and yes. uh, with cities that, was it the original script kitty who did it? No, what, he just, they, they just want, they want to get in, install their software and get out. And then sell access. That's right. Because that's quick money. So why do people do it? For money. Yeah. And that's how they do it. So, um, yeah, you got to kind of keep things up to date. So, the, you know, it's just a quick thought to ponder. Hey, if you've got any obsolete machines on your network, you've got to get them off. And get your staff trained on cybersecurity practices. Understand what phishing scams are because, you know, oh, well, somebody clicked on a link and now their computer's infected. But their computer is on your network. But I was going to get half of that prince's money. <laughs> That's a whole other <laughs> can of worms right there, Jeff. But I mean, I, when it comes to these kind of things, to look at your system and say, oh, I don't want to spend seven, 800 bucks for a new computer. I sure. won't worry about updating this one. You'll end up spending more in the long run uh, or in, in the short term. Um, no, in the long run, if you don't have your system patched, because once they get access to everything, you could be down and out. But I, and I think... It, when they have access to everything. I think it's just important to realize that that one entry point becomes access to, to everything. everything. So spend a couple of hundred bucks, get the new computer. <laughs> Save yourself. I don't know what it takes. I mean, it's different, it's different for every case, right? Yeah. I had one person today who called and said, I have a single Windows 7 computer. I don't want to upgrade it because it just works. Oh. So here's, here's an explanation. And here, Becca has shared with us a story that simply tells us that all they need is access to that one computer. 
and now they've got access to all computers of your computers and not in just like a samba way not in a a way that's like friendly and hopefully they don't find any ways into the back doors on those computers no they have administrator credentials on your network so they can do anything that's right anything they want when i think about my house i think i've got you're done i think i have seven devices not including phones and tablets and stuff like that that are connected to the network mm -hmm. it's like, i don't want them to have access to that yeah i just can't stress enough though jeff i mean i think in the terms of businesses more so oh, than the yeah. home user but once they're in they're in you can't that you're done because yeah. you can't now shut down that Windows machine, that Windows 7 machine. No, they're already into everything. So what do you do? Replace everything? Have every single computer wiped? Because you don't know what tools they've installed. That's expensive. Yeah. So don't fall into that. Anyways, that's a bad exploit. That's a really serious, folks. I hope yeah. we've stressed that enough that you understand that this is a bad one. So yeah. make sure your network administrators are up and up and they understand these things and that you are protected and safe against these kinds of threats. Mm -hmm. All right, we're gonna head back to Becca. Three JavaScript packages have been removed from the NPM portal for containing malicious code. According to advisories from the NPM security team, the three JavaScript libraries open shells on the computers of developers who imported the packages into their projects. The shells allow threat actors to connect remotely to the infected computer and execute malicious operations. The NPM security team said that the shells don't depend on a particular operating system and could be used to compromise Windows, Linux, FreeBSD, OpenBSD, and other systems. All three packages were uploaded to the NPM portal in 2018 and each had hundreds of downloads since then. The package's names are Plutov-Slack-Client, Node-Test-199, and Node-Test-1010. The NPM security team said, Any computer that, is, that has this package installed or running should be considered fully compromised. All secrets and keys stored on that computer should be rotated immediately from a different computer. They warn the package should be removed, but as full control of the computer may have been given to an outside entity, there is no guarantee that removing the package will remove all malicious software resulting from installing it. MPM security staff regularly scans its collection of JavaScript libraries, considered the largest package repository for any programming language. Well, I can't even get good cell cover coverage at my cottage, Nokia is working with NASA to bring 4G to the moon. NASA's Artemis mission aims to establish a long-term human presence on the moon as a stepping stone toward Mars colonization. And to get things started, NASA is extending $370 million to 14 companies to provide the technology for the program from robotics to power generation and even cryogenics. But it makes sense that these teams will need to be able to communicate with the mother planet. The new network will be designed specifically for lunar conditions, able to withstand the extreme temperature shifts and radiation. The tech will also utilize small cell tech, which, as the name suggests, is significantly smaller than the tall cell towers they are used to seeing here on Earth. They also use a lot less power. The plan is for a lunar lander to carry the 4G communication system to the lunar surface in 2022. Nokia's Bell Labs has been granted $14.1 million for their part. A new 80-watt wireless charging tech from Xiaomi is blowing our minds, and the Raspberry Pi Compute Module 4 has been released. We'll let you know the specs and how this changes things for industrial IoT. Becca has these stories coming up. Plus, Robert is here with the Crypto Corner. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back to the world of cryptos and welcome back to the Crypto Corner. Last week we spoke about banks. In a few years' time you will not recognize them anymore. And uh, I also mentioned to you not so long ago the Chinese digital currency, 
that will replace the RIMMB and that they already implemented it and they are running some trials in Shenzhen. Now, this week there has been some development and I would like to talk about that because it will have a direct impact on your life and my life. So, let's dive into this here. <clears throat> The International Monetary Fund, and the head of that international organization is a lady called Kristalina Georgieva, and she delivered a speech in regards to the new Bretton Woods moment. Now, what is a Bretton Woods? Bretton Woods system is uh, monetary management established uh, the rules of commercial and financial relations between uh, countries like US, Canada, Western Europe, Australia, and Japan. And so its uh, the system was first example of a fully negotiated order intended to govern monetary relations between independent states. So that was Bretton Woods. And she's speaking about the change of that system into something more modern. Now, interesting enough, on Monday there was a meeting with a few central bankers talking about so-called cross-border payments. But if you think about it, look what type of people there were uh, present. So you've got the head of the Saudi Central Bank, you have got the head of all the central banks, the head of the IMF, the head of the US Central Bank, and the head of the Malaysian Central Bank. Missing is Europe, which is interesting, but there will be a reason, I guess. So they met together to talk about gross border payments. Now, I don't believe that that's a real story. The real story uh, was also published by a gentleman called Raul Paul, uh, which I totally concur with. So his thoughts is exactly how I'm thinking. And what he's talking about is exactly this meeting that happened on Monday that will replace the old Bretton Woods uh, relationship between uh, countries. So <clears throat> what will happen? It looks like that the central banks will collude and come up with a system uh, a central bank system between all of them. So there will not be not a US dollar central bank system. There will be one for each, uh, for all organizations. And then from there, it will be um, diversified. And what can you do with such a system? That's the interesting part. And th I love that. Is <clears throat> So it will change the, the circumvent, the banking and finance, uh, fiscal system, because you're directly interacting with people. Yeah, so it's not like at the moment, where the central bank in the US or Canada doesn't matter, <clears throat> comes up with some policy and then it goes, it trickles down um, uh, the chain and you as the individual user, you probably see the least amount of money and probably at the highest interest rate that you can think of. Other people will benefit much stronger. With digital money <clears throat> plus uh, cryptocurrency, so programmable money, you're able to do much more because now the central bank can directly influence uh, the behavior of people. And how do they do that? Yes, they can say, well, if you're a restaurant owner, you can uh, you get the money directly into your pocket from us. Yeah, so no more banks involved. We'll do it directly. It's possible. It's central bank money. They can change interest rates. So in one uh, instance or one industry, they can have higher interest rate than in other. Um, what will happen with taxes? Yeah, what will happen with the IRS? Because they can deal with these things directly through programmable money. It will take time to get it to that ultimate extent, but it will happen, um, as you as you can see. So direct payments will be possible. Um, they're also talking here about um, yeah behavioral uh, economics. Uh, so not through some economists that are telling the government what to do and what not to do, because that has failed in the past, uh, everybody's saying. So what they're going to do is like a Facebook type of idea or TikTok idea or YouTube idea where you're interested in people befriending you or where people are, you're interested in getting more likes. And so you change your behavior in regards to getting more likes. And the same thing will happen with the money. So, and that will be all regulated through a central bank uh, without anybody from the outside world having a chance to have a significant influence. So how that will look like at the end, nobody knows, of course, but that these people are meeting together to discuss uh, cross-order payments is something that I find uh, highly interesting. And uh, that is, of course, fantastic news for uh, Bitcoin because Bitcoin is outside of that system. There's nobody that 
can regulate uh, Bitcoin. It's decentralized, um, it's immutable, but you know all the features of, of uh, Bitcoin. So um, Bitcoin is a fantastic alternative. All the other cryptocurrencies, the major ones, are definitely a good alternative. Let's see what Libra will bring up. But there will be some good alternatives to um, to the central uh, centrally uh, driven money through central banks. So I hope you found that interesting and I hope you liked it and I hope I get a like from you and I wish you a fantastic week. So thank you very much for watching. Bye bye. Thank you, Robert. Just a reminder, we're not providing financial advice, but only sharing what's happening in the cryptocurrency market. Always remember that the cryptocurrency markets are ever changing and always volatile. So you should only spend what you can afford to lose. Now back to Becca in the newsroom. Thank you, Robbie. Xiaomi has announced a new charging tech that can fully charge a depleted smartphone in less than 20 minutes, but it does it without any wires. Fast charging has become a key feature of many smartphones in recent years, and for convenience sake, wireless charging can be really great. But of course, wireless charging typically charges a phone with between 10 to 15 watts of power. Some phones, like the OnePlus 8 Pro, have wireless charging up to 40 watts, but Xiaomi's new charging tech promises a whopping 80 watts of wireless juice. What does that mean in practical terms? Well, according to the announcement unveiling the 80-watt Mi wireless charging technology, a smartphone with 0% charge of a 4,000 milliamp hours battery will charge 10% in just one minute, 50% in eight minutes, and be fully charged after 19 minutes. Finally, a charger that will charge my phone from zero to 100% right? in like my lunch break. See, that's nice. That's a game changer. Can you imagine? I think about my kids and how we have like phones everywhere. I Obviously, know. I mean, this is going to take like the latest and greatest tech, but um, it's always a case of, oh, I forgot to put my phone on the charger or it doesn't last long enough for the entire day. And now that, you know, with the pandemic, of course, my kids are being homeschooled now kind of by force and everybody's on their devices the whole yeah. time. So we've got Zoom meetings happening on phones and and it runs it depletes the battery yes but what i like is that it's wireless it's not just wired that's fast amazing charging. yeah it's wireless that's huge like yeah the idea that i could take my phone not have to worry about chargers and just go just set it down set it down 20 minutes later i'm good to go that i love the other thing that i love about it the the concept is that um i think about as you just did if i could set it down on a table what if you could set it down on a restaurant table? Yes. Because a lot of restaurants have gone the route, and I'm using restaurants as the example, but a lot of places have gone the route of embedding USB. Yes. So that you can plug in your USB cable to charge your phone. But then all of a sudden people got wise to the fact that, oh, those USB ports could be malicious because yeah. USB also carries data or That's right. who knows if it's too many volts and that you know maybe it's sh got a short or something like that and could fry my phone so then all of a sudden we're afraid to plug into the USB port because hey it could be something bad That's right. Well, wireless charging you Don't set it down, it. it charges and you pick it up and you're done. Yeah. But you can set it down for like 3 minutes and it's given you enough of a charge to get through most of the afternoon, which is incredible. Awesome. I, I, I think just as a, I mean, you look around now and you've got all these charge stations for electric vehicles. It would be great to start seeing little pop-ups in public places with this kind of stuff where you can literally put your phone down for five minutes and have enough to have a phone call to get help or whatever. Mm -hmm. And it's all wirelessly. I just pictured like a stretch of road. <laughs> <laughs> and embed the receiver in the car and it recharges the uh, autonomous car that as it drives awesome. over this thing. Whoa, we're getting into the tech now, folks. <laughs> <laughs> Still, I like it. I'm excited about it. The crazy thing is, just uh, in conclusion, is that while what I just said is very sci-fi, like when we were growing up, that was like the future. It's totally doable. It's possible now. Yep. That's ridiculous. The Raspberry Pi Foundation has launched a compute module with the specs of a Raspberry Pi 4. The Raspberry Pi Foundation launched a new product Monday, the, comp the Compute Module 4. 
It's hard to believe it's been so long, but the Raspberry Pi 4 was released in June 2019. The Compute Module 4 brings the Pi 4 to the industrial IoT space, featuring the same processor packed in a Compute Module, just begging to be integrated into powerful IoT appliances. If you're unfamiliar with Compute Modules, you can think of them as single-board computers without all the ports and GPIO pins. They allow the computer components, the brains, of a Raspberry Pi to be integrated into robotics, smart devices, maker tech, clusters, or anything you can come up with that requires a tiny, low-powered Linux computer at its heart. Since the Compute Module 4 shares its spec with the Raspberry Pi 4, developers can do all their prototyping on the Pi 4 SBC, but then order a bunch of Compute Module 4s to integrate into their commercial product. Just like the Raspberry Pi 4, the Compute Module 4 features a 64-bit ARM-based processor with Video Core VI graphics. This is going to represent a huge upgrade for previous Compute Module customers, and with 4K video output, output at up to 60 frames per second, plus the ability to decode H.265 video, the Compute Module 4, the Compute Module 4 could be a game changer for multimedia-driven devices such as smart TVs or set-top boxes. The Compute Module 4 is available with your choice of 1, 2, 4, or 8 gigabytes RAM and 8, 16, or 32 gigabytes onboard eMMC flash storage. Wi-Fi and Bluetooth are also optional. The price ranges from just $25 to $90 USD. Now imagine that, Jeff. The Raspberry Pi Compute Module 4 yeah. in one of your SBC projects or something like that, powering it like the brains. See, this, this is a pretty awesome. powerful... Soon as Becca said H.265 decoding, so that's like video that is very CPU intensive. Yeah. That's awesome. That's, like it says me, a lot. That's more power than my Plex server. Yes. Which, like, who knows where that's going to take things. I like the idea of cluster computing. And yeah, that's where okay. you take several computers, connect them together through networking, and basically install... Um, software, Beowulf or something like that, that clusters them to make them be able to perform tasks together in such a way that it basically makes a supercomputer right. out of several computers. So you think about these Raspberry Pi cl uh, cluster or the modules the, mm -hmm. and, and put like 10 of those together in a, a, a cluster and you'd have like this compute module cluster That'd be nice. computer with that much power. When you can have eight gigs of RAM on each board, times that by <laughs> you can 10. Do a lot. You can do a lot. It's changing things, folks. The world is changing, mm -hmm. that's for sure. What would you do with all that power? And silence. He's waiting for you to answer. I, I'm thinking, I'm like, what would I do with that power? <laughs> How many people just went, Bitcoin mining. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, guys. It's, you, you know what's yeah. sad? My first thought was, could I automate like some of the utilities that I have in the kitchen to make food for me? That was my first thought. With a with a compute module four? Yeah. Takes more than that, but I, I know it but could be the brains of such an operation. Clearly, I am hungry, though. <laughs> <laughs> Your thoughts, comment below. We'd love to hear what, uh, what you would do with a Compute Module 4. Thanks for watching the Category 5.TV Newsroom. Don't forget to like and subscribe for all your tech news with a slight Linux bias. And if you appreciate what we do, become a patron at patreon.com slash Category 5. From the Category 5.TV Newsroom, I'm Becca Ferguson. That is well, pretty much all the time that we have for this week. Jeff, yeah. last week we went through and, and, and I did the whole process with Fiverr, hired some yes, folks to, for the to redo music. our remix. Yeah, here's a funny story. Okay. Literary, Tell me when to laugh. You'll know. <laughs> Lit he already did. He already laughed. <gasps> Literary Squirrel 
was one of our guys. Yes, yeah, yeah. One okay. of our remixers. And Literary Squirrel said, I kept wondering, this is as he was watching the feature afterwards, I kept wondering why you were mispronouncing my name. Oh. Literary Squirrel. So I checked my profile and found that I misspelled it. Oh no! And never noticed, and it was that way for three years. Are you serious? He says, my name, my band name is Literary Squirrel. Oh my goodness. He left off an R. That's funny. So I tell you this story. See, it's funny. See, I told you it was funny. It was like, oh. <laughs> I tell you this story because then I said to myself, well, I see words and I, and I, I think for the most part, I pronounce them fairly meticulously. So when I right. see literary, even though that's not a word, I said it the way it reads. Right. So I thought I'd probably be a pretty good proofreader. So I said, ah, oh, what the heck, I'll give it a go. So I put up an ad that said, I will proofread your text, 500 words or less, for five bucks. Okay. And I was like, ah, nobody will ever go for it. It's fun anyways, I thought I'd give it a try. And the next morning I had an email from a, uh, a person in Spain who was, um, is uh, an insurance broker. Okay. And has a customer who is English speaking natively and wanted to make sure that he was saying the right things in response to an email. So he removed all the confidential stuff yep. and sent me his response and said, can you just go over this for me? And I did, and I went through and I corrected some things and he had some words that didn't really make sense in translation and so I fixed it and I corrected the, the grammar and the context and a little bit of spelling. And he was like, he loved it. Five bucks. Really? It took me 10 minutes, and it was just something I did with a cup of coffee first thing in the morning. Yeah. And he huh. g gave me a five out of five review. That's awesome. So I was like, that's Fiverr from the flip perspective. So I'm like, this is pretty neat. So then I start talking to my kids, and I'm like, we should find out if like you guys could do stuff on there, and you know, do my daughter's an artist, and she could do drawings for people. Start and making it's, money. It's kind of a neat idea, a neat Very platform. Cool. I don't know what the rules are about like minimum age and things like that, but we can look into those yeah. kinds of things. But that's my story for this week: is that hey, I, I went on the flip side too, mm. and I sold my own service. <laughs> I gave Literary Squirrel. A free, a freebie, um, but uh, now I'm 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 available for sale. I I I feel like it would be fun to just give you the five bucks, and I'll send you a 500 word document, all lorem ipsum, and just tell me if it makes sense. I'll do my best. I'll do my <laughs> best. <laughs> Have you correct that? <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, that's that's it, Jeff. That's all the time. Okay. But it's been a lot of fun. Uh, I've enjoyed being here with you again this week. Next week, we are getting into 3D printing. So Excellent. we're going to be assembling an Ender 3 V2. Um, so we're going to actually put it together and then we're going to have a chat about, you know, what the process has been like for me as uh, a noob in the 3D printing realm. So what kind of challenges have I encountered and can you possibly encounter as you get started in 3D printing? Plus, I'll show you not only my first print, but my first designs Ooh, very in exciting. print. You don't want to miss out next week. So have a great week, everybody. We'll see you. Bye.